Welcome to People and Profit, your essential business briefing. Coming up, as French motorists complain about high fuel costs, we'll look at the future of the oil market and what it might mean for prices. Could playing host to a major financial centre actually damage a country's economy? We'll speak to the author of a book who says that finance can be a curse. And we'll tell you why the Chinese government is cracking down on the booming video game industry. First, though, to anger among motorists here in France. They're unhappy with the rising cost of fuel and have called for the government to do something about it. In particular, they want a planned tax increase on diesel and petrol, due to come into force in January, to be scrapped. But the fluctuating price of oil is also hitting prices at the pump, as Brian Quinn reports. French drivers up in arms over recent hikes in the cost of fuel. We're taxed enormously by the state. They take advantage of drivers. We just have to pay and pay. But what really goes into the price at the pump? First, the cost of crude oil on the global market. Here in France, that makes up roughly 30% of the final retail price. The lion's share, though, is indeed taxes, which account for a full 60%. Distribution and refining costs make up the rest. In the U.S., by contrast, crude oil is 50% of the cost, with taxes just 19%. Distribution and refining take higher percentages due to the lower tax burden. Drivers on both sides of the Atlantic have seen their fuel costs rise considerably in the past two years. The reason? Between a low in 2016 and a peak this past October, crude oil prices nearly tripled. And since transactions on crude markets are conducted in U.S. currency, a strengthening dollar has meant Eurozone drivers take an extra hit at the pump. But crude prices have fallen sharply since that October peak. So why are French drivers only seeing their cost fall by a few cents per liter? That's due to what's called latency. Refining oil into fuel is expensive and time-consuming, resulting in a lag between shifts on the crude and retail markets. Refineries can also reduce their output supply to take advantage of cheaper crude and boost profit margins. And with the Macron government sticking to its plan to raise taxes on fuel, French drivers can likely expect high prices for the foreseeable future. So what's been happening on the oil market and what should we expect in the future? Kate Moody's been finding out. Kate. Well, Stephen, oil prices are often volatile and the past 12 months have been especially choppy. The price of the international benchmark Brent crude climbed above $80 a barrel for the first time in four years in October, but has since slumped. We may be looking at continued price turmoil in years to come because of shifts in supply and demand. Production has broadly risen over the last year, despite the OPEC-led effort to scale back output. The US, Russia and Saudi Arabia have been pumping at or near record levels. Now, though, Riyadh is leading a new push to reduce production as it worries about weaker prices. Renewed U.S. sanctions on Iran could also lower global supplies. Now, as long as demand remains strong, supplies are likely to keep coming. OPEC predicts the world's appetite for crude to come just under 99 million barrels a day next year. That's less than its previous forecast. The International Energy Agency, meanwhile, predicts demand will peak at 106 million barrels per day in 2040. After that, though, the IEA sees consumption in developed countries starting to fade as renewable energy sources become more prevalent. Different sectors are evolving at different paces. The use of traditional fuel in cars, for example, is expected to peak in seven years. But demand in the aviation and petrochemicals industries will make up for it. If, however, countries implemented the targets set in the Paris Climate Agreement, the scales would tip much more rapidly. The IEA forecast in that scenario that global use of oil would peak a full decade earlier in 2030. With questions over both supply and demand, oil markets are set for more uncertainty to come. Stephen? Kate, thank you very much for that. Now, the financial industry is the UK's biggest source of exports and tax revenue. But a new book is claiming that it's become so large that it's actually harming the British economy. The finance curse estimates that damage over a period of 23 years to be worth the equivalent of more than €5 trillion. Euros. I'm joined now from Berlin by the book's author, the journalist Nicholas Schaxson. Nicholas, thanks for being with us. How does then the finance sector harm the UK economy? Well, the City of London financial sector puts out this story that it's the generator of jobs and tax revenues. Um, 
And, and you know, there, there is that, 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 that is true, but there is another whole side to this story. Um, essentially, the financial sector has turned into something that around a core of useful activity, I mean, we all need finance. We need it to, to finance investments and, and, you know, to pay our checks and things like that. Um, but around this useful core, there has grown up over the years uh, a completely different creature, a much more predatory creature, um, of which is basically a, a, a series of mechanisms of wealth extraction from other parts of the economy. So you will have, uh, you know, the most obvious example of that is, is big banks taking huge risks uh, uh, before the financial crisis, and then when the crisis hit, um, they kept their winnings, and the rest of us taxpayers had to had to bail them out and suffer huge economic crisis afterwards. Um, but there are endless examples of this, and it's not just the financial sector. What's happened is you've had. The whole kind of ethos of finance, a series of financial techniques um, used by private equity firms, hedge funds, and many others, um, that have uh, penetrated the real economy, manufacturing, agriculture, whatever, services. Um, and they've started using these te techniques to turn these, um, you know, what is a, you know, the productive economy, um, turn them into kind of cash cows. They're, they're ways of extracting, they find ways of extracting wealth from these companies. Um, and uh, and use them to you know boost the pay packets of private equity titans and, and and so on. Does Brexit have the potential to change this dominance of the financial industry if we see, as we've seen flagged, you know, banks and financial services moving out of London to various locations across Europe? Well, Brexit is a complicated um, issue, of course. Now there are kind of two ways that things could go um, with Brexit, the financial sector. Um, there are a group of people in the UK who are who are big cheerleaders for finance that want to, they call it the sort of Singapore on the Thames model. In other words, Britain is going to turn itself into even more of a tax haven than it already is. Cut taxes, cut regulations, let the financial sector do what it is, do, do what it does, um, let it grow as big as possible. And that, um, for them, is the route forward to prosperity. Um, and, uh, you know, Britain has served as a kind of offshore island attracting, you know, it has deregulated further and faster than almost any other large economy. And um, it has attracted huge amounts of um, activity, financial activity as a result, um, but bringing the finance curse with it. Um, so there are so there is this side of people who want to double down on Brexit. On the other hand, there is still huge lingering anger after the global financial crisis, and there are a lot of other people who would like to use Brexit as, as an opportunity to shrink the financial sector. And I think the very fact of Brexit uh, by making it harder to for financial services firms to operate across Europe, in particular, will uh, damage the UK financial sector. Um, and in a and positive so, way, you know, we'll, is that, we'll is that damage it. needed? Well, it depends how the damage happens. If it damages the useful stuff, then that would be a negative. But uh, certainly it would damage a lot of the harmful stuff. It would reduce the ability of um, financial uh, services activities that are, that are involved in these more predatory activities to operate. So there would be, you know, there would be a balance of, of harm and, uh, and benefit from Brexit to the UK as a whole. Um, but there would be net harm to the UK financial sector, that's for sure. So how do you rebalance then? How do you fix the finance curse problem? Well, this is a question that I get asked, and it's actually, uh, there's no, it's one of these things that, that uh, it's effective, effectively saying, how do you fix the global economy? Because this process that we've been seeing with the UK at the forefront of it is right at the heart of financial globalisation and, and the global economy. I think an understanding of the finance curse uh, phenomenon, um, which tells you that if you do this, you, will, you may well increase the size of the financial sector, but that will tend to harm the economy as a whole. I think that opens up whole new vistas of possibility for taxing and regulating um, finance and the financial sector and, and regulating your economy appropriately. You don't have to cut taxes, you don't have to deregulate. Um, because in, at the end of the day, if you do things, these things, it will harm the economy. OK, Nicholas Jackson, author of The Finance Curse, thank you very much for speaking to us. Turning next to a crackdown on video games by the Chinese authorities. Beijing has slashed the number of licences it grants for new games from 9,000 last year to under 2,000 this year. It's a move that's hitting the entire sector from technology giant Tencent to smaller startups. From Beijing, Charles Pellegram reports. Xu is one of China's 600 million gamers, and he always keeps an eye on new releases. 
So when Monster Hunter came out earlier this year, he was excited to buy it. But in August, the game was banned for being too violent. At the time, I thought Tencent would relaunch the game, but they actually didn't do that. I didn't get a refund, and I bought a new copy on Steam. Just like Xu, many gamers in China have switched to the unregulated U.S. platform Steam. In the past year, the offer on local marketplaces has dwindled because of a freeze on new releases. One of the government's concerns is the effect gaming is having on young people. Professor Chun teaches video game development. For him, the government's reasoning is justified. Young people spend too much time playing games instead of studying. It's bad for the growth of talent in our country. The authorities issued a string of regulations. One requires game companies to limit children's gaming time in order to protect their eyesight. Under another, all new games are subject to a very strict review process before being released. AOK Game is one of the many video game startups in China. They produce content that serves both the domestic and overseas market. While they understand the regulations, they find the process cumbersome and especially tough for a young company like theirs. I think it's not bad for the game market as a whole, but it makes the industry standards too high for startups. And then there's an indirect effect. As supervision and regulations are enhanced, many game companies are setting their sights on the overseas markets. This poses a threat to us. Beijing hasn't approved any new titles for months a freeze that's expected to last until next year. In the meantime, AOK Game will have to rely on international gamers to build its business. Well, that's it from us for this week, but you'll find the best of our global business coverage on our Facebook page, or you can tweet me with your questions at NewStephen. Until next time, thanks for watching. You might watch France 24 in English, but don't forget, France 24 is also broadcast in French, Arabic, and Spanish. Available on cable and satellite systems and online media in France and around the world.